In this video, we're going to explore how to implement zero trust on a network by reviewing the official architecture guide developed by NIST. Special Publication 80207 is widely considered the definitive blueprint for zero trust, and we're going to break down the key takeaways across four main sections. We'll start by reviewing the fundamentals of zero trust, including the core tenets and principles behind the cybersecurity model. Then we'll take a deep dive into the logical components of a zero trust architecture and explore the various technologies that bring this all together. By the end of the video, you should have a clear understanding of what a zero trust architecture entails and how it operates within a network. Let's start with the basics, which is that zero trust is not a single product or solution, but rather the principle that no user or system inside or outside the network should be implicitly trusted. Instead, every access request must be verified and continuously validated based on multiple factors. Unlike traditional security models, where trust was given to users inside the network or once they pass a certain checkpoint, Zero Trust has no concept of internal or external users. That is, users, devices, applications, and connections are independently verified on a contextual basis. A Zero Trust architecture, as defined by NIST 800-207, is a cybersecurity architecture built on Zero Trust. It provides a set of guiding principles that organizations can use to effectively adopt and implement Zero Trust. This includes guidance on workflows, system design, and key architectural components that we'll review later. Now, at its most basic level, NIST 800-207 defines a Zero Trust workflow with a subject attempting to access a resource. A subject is defined as either a user or machine coming from anywhere in the world. In Zero Trust, since there's no more concept of a traditional perimeter, this area is called the untrusted zone. The resource being accessed represents the protected element, whether it's a system, data set, application, or service that the organization aims to secure. In between the subject and resource is a policy decision and enforcement point, which brokers connections based on a number of different factors that we'll see later. This component is an essential element to the Zero Trust architecture because it validates an authorized request from the subject to the resource. The PDP PEP component is placed as close to the resource as possible, creating an implicit trust zone, which represents the area where all entities are trusted to at least the given resource. Ideally, the implicit trust zone is as small as possible, and trust is applied specifically to the resource. The larger the implicit trust zone is, the more risk that a compromised system can lead to lateral movement and compromise other systems. At a high level, this flow represents a zero trust architectural flow for every single request that occurs on a network. Later in the video, we'll break down this flow into individual components and technologies that allow this to happen. The zero trust architecture provides organizations with a framework for developing their cybersecurity strategy. While there is flexibility in how each organization builds its specific implementation, NIST 800-207 outlines seven core tenets that must be fulfilled in order to meet the requirements of a zero trust architecture. Tenant number one, all data sources and computing services are considered resources. Tenant number two, all communication is secured regardless of network location. Tenant number three states that access to individual enterprise resources is granted on a per session basis. Tenant number four states that every access request is evaluated by a dynamic policy. This dynamic policy should consider identity and authentication as well as device security posture and other contextual factors. Tenant number five states that authentication and authorization is strictly enforced before the subject is given access to a resource. Number six, enterprise monitors and measures the integrity and security posture of all owned and associated assets. Lastly, tenant number seven states that logging and continuous reassessment of the current state of assets, network infrastructure, and communication. While there may be various approaches to accomplishing a zero trust architecture, these seven tenants must remain true for any implementation to accomplish a zero trust architecture. By now, you likely have a solid understanding of what zero trust architecture is and how it operates at a conceptual level. Let's now take a deeper dive at each of the core components that bring the zero trust architecture to life. Let's start by expanding our foundational diagram between the subject, the policy decision and enforcement point, and the resource. The policy decision and enforcement point is actually made up of two distinct components that work together to ultimately allow or deny communication from subject to resource. 
These two components are decoupled with one doing the enforcement while the other makes the decisions. The policy decision point lives in the control plane layer and it's responsible for ultimately deciding whether a subject should be granted access to a given resource. The policy enforcement point on the other hand resides in the data plane layer, positioned close to the resource and responsible for enforcing decisions made by the policy decision point. In other words, the enforcement point acts as a gatekeeper following the instructions issued by the decision point. The architecture allows for gatekeeping to happen near the resource while keeping policy logic and decision making centralized. As mentioned earlier, the ideal setup places these enforcement points close to each protected resource, serving as a gateway between the untrusted zone and the trusted environment. NIST 800-207 publication actually splits the role of the decision point further into two functions, a policy engine and a policy administrator. The policy engine uses a trust algorithm made up of both internal and external sources to grant, deny, or revoke access to a resource based off of these contextual factors. At the heart of a zero trust architecture is a policy engine, which makes decisions based on several data sources and policies. These could include internal rules such as data access policies, network and system activity, such as telemetry information from security devices, identity and access management rules, SIM events, and CDM systems. The policy engine could also make decisions based off of external data sources, such as threat intelligence feeds, which may provide information about newly discovered attack or vulnerabilities on the network. These internal and external data points are ultimately calculated as part of the policy engine's algorithm to make a decision. Once a decision has been made, the policy engine instructs the policy administrator to generate session-specific authentication token or credentials. These are sent to the enforcement point and used by the client to access the requested resource. As outlined in the Zero Trust tenant, the tokens are valid only for the specific session which is requested and can be revoked at any given time if the security posture on the network changes, ensuring that access remains dynamic and continuously validated. In a zero trust architecture, the policy decision point and enforcement point remain in communication to ensure that changes to security posture and policies are enforced swiftly. In fact, the decision point is one of the most critical components in a zero trust architecture. It acts as a brain behind every access decision that is ultimately made on the network. While enforcement points control the gates, the decision point decides who gets through and under what conditions. It's also in a continuous state of evaluating contextual signals that we reviewed earlier, such as user identity, device posture, locations, and threat intelligence, to ultimately decide whether access is granted or denied. While NIST keeps the PDP abstract, the technology typically consists of a central policy engine that integrates with identity providers like Azure AD or Okta, posture management tools such as MDM or EDR solutions, and real-time analytic platforms such as a SIM appliance. It then translates enterprise policies into dynamic decisions, ensuring that access is not only authenticated but continuously authorized based on risk. Without a well-integrated policy decision point, Zero Trust breaks down into static controls, missing the entire point of adaptive conditional security. NIST 800-207 publication for Zero Trust architecture is intentionally abstract of specific technologies that make up the various components in this design. In fact, there are multiple approaches an enterprise could take when it comes to how they implement a Zero Trust architecture, with certain approaches better suited for specific use cases than others. In part two of the Zero Trust architecture series, we'll examine how these approaches impact the kind of technology that is selected and used for a given design. We'll then see what technologies are behind the components we just reviewed and how they ultimately come together to offer a zero trust architecture model. Well, that does it for this video, guys. And again, I hope you found it informative. As always, the only thing I ask is that you please hit like down below to give me a boost in the YouTube algorithm and consider subscribing if you haven't already to stay on top of our latest releases here at the CISO Perspective.